Have you ever wondered why end time Bible prophecy seems to focus on the Jewish people and the nation of Israel? And why should a Gentile Christian be concerned about what is happening among the Jewish people today? For a discussion of these questions and others related to Israel in prophecy, stay tuned. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. Those of you who are regular viewers are probably wondering why in the world I'm sitting in this chair where our guests normally sit. Well, the reason is because my colleague Nathan Jones is going to interview me today about my latest book. So he insisted that I sit in the hot seat. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, folks, I'm going to be asking Dave some questions today about his latest book, this one called Israel and Bible Prophecy Past, Present, and Future. Wow, Dave, 15 books, not yeah. counting all the ones that you've had revised editions. How long did it take you to write such a book? Well, I'm going to answer that philosophically. Philosophically, yes. okay. Okay. For many years, my wife and I have had a hobby, and the hobby is collecting Southwestern art. Okay. We specialize in, in collecting landscapes that have Spanish missions in them. And we've done this for many, many years. And during the time I've gotten acquainted with many artists in the New Mexico area. That's primarily where we, we get these paintings is out of Santa Fe and Taos. Mm -hmm. And one of the uh, painters that we collected several paintings from was a man by the name of Carlos Hall who lived in Taos. And uh, one time we were in Taos on vacation I just picked up the phone and called him and I said, Sir, we have several of your paintings. Is there any possibility we could meet you? And he said, Oh yeah, he was very gracious. He said, Come on out, I'd love to meet you. Well, I didn't realize how gracious he was because he was 65 years old and dying when we got there. He oh, had goodness. emphysema, he could hardly breathe, okay. he had to have an oxygen mask on all the time. And uh, he uh, was so gracious, he showed us all over his house, he took us across uh, uh, to his studio and showed us his studio. And while we were viewing his studio, he had a magnificent painting, a huge painting of a Taos Indian on horseback. And I asked him, I said, Mr. Hall, how long did it take you to paint that painting? And he looked at it for a moment and he looked at me and he said, 65 years. And I knew immediately what he meant, that, that this was a painting he could not have painted 10 years ago. It, it was his entire life, his experiences, his experiences with the Indians there, uh, his uh, experience in painting and developing his skills over a long period of time, his whole life was yes. into that painting. And that is the day we deal with this book. I first became interested in Bible prophecy in 1967 when the Six Day War was going on, and I started studying it. And I have been studying Bible prophecy intensely for 50 years. And during that time, I have been to Israel almost 50 times. I've become acquainted with the land. I've become acquainted with the people. I've become personally acquainted with Jewish people, with both believers and non believers. And all of that experience and all of that study went into the production of this book. This was a work of love. And it's a book I couldn't have written 10 years ago or 15 years ago or 20 years ago. It's 50 years of work. 50 years of work. <laughs> I used to live in Philadelphia yeah. and I had many Messianic Jewish friends. Yeah. I was at many Messianic Jewish ministries. And yet they didn't seem to have the passion that you have <laughs> for Israel. Honest to goodness, his passion well. for Israel is unbelievable. You love the Jewish people. And every page of this book seems to show your love for the Jewish people. Well, I love them because God loves them passionately. That you do. That you do. <laughs> now, you say the purpose, if you go in the, uh, in the front here at the preface, you say the purpose for this book, this book will clearly show that God has also been fulfill, faithful in fulfilling yes. the prophecy He has given to the Jewish prophets concerning the future of their people to this day. And because of that, we can be assured that God will fulfill all the prophecies concerning Israel that are yet future. And the prophecies yet to be filled are mind boggling. Yes. And by the time I was done this book, my mind was boggling. And I've been <laughs> reading this stuff for years. You made it so easy to understand. Would you agree? That's the purpose of your book, to show how important Israel is in Bible yes, prophecy. That's the purpose. And, and I focused on them because that's what end time Bible prophecy focuses on, yes. is, the, is the people of Israel, the nation of Israel. And one of the reasons for that is because the church is going to be taken out in the rapture before the tribulation begins. So the entire focus of God shifts from the church to the Jewish people. And his purpose in regathering them, 
His purpose in bringing the world against them is not because He hates the Jewish people, but because He loves them so much He wants to bring them to the end of themselves where they will finally look upon Him whom they have pierced, weep and well and mourn, and receive Yeshua as their Messiah. Amen. So, God is working out a great plan among the Jewish people. End time Bible prophecy focuses on them, and that's the reason I wrote this book. Now, a lot of people in, in Christendom would disagree with you. They would say Israel has no place at all. Would you say that this book is also a treatise against what's called replacement theology, that the church has replaced Israel? Absolutely. Uh, okay. that, that is just one of the worst doctrines that ever came into the history of the church. And the Bible specifically refutes it in Romans 9 through 11, all three chapters make it very clear God still loves the Jewish people. He still has a purpose for the okay. Jewish people. And He is going to bring a great remnant to salvation in the end times. And yet the church for 2,000 years has taught that God washed His hands of the Jewish people because they killed Jesus. And yet in Acts, the book of Acts, we're told point blank that those who killed is, uh, uh, Jesus were Herod, Pontius Pilate, the Gentiles, and the Jews. Everybody. And you and me. You and me. All, All right. of us have the blood of Jesus on our hands because He died for our sins. We know it's funny that the church is always willing to take the blessings of Israel, but they're never willing to take the curses. Oh yeah, we and want all the blessings, we don't want any of the curses, that's for sure. And when I look at how you divided the book up, because you yeah. divided up to four different prophecies that fulfilled in the past, yeah. uh, seven that are happening here in the present, the 20th century, and then uh, one that's future. And it looks like the four that you gave in the past were all curses upon Israel. Would you mind listing the four that you went through dealing yes. with pre 20th century? God warned the Jewish people over and over through Moses before they went into the land mm -hmm. that if they were not faithful He would send prophets to warn them and He would send remedial judgments. And He said, if you refuse to repent the ultimate judgment will be your expulsion from the land. You will still own it, it will still be yours, but you will not be able to enjoy it. I will expel you. And so the first one is the worldwide dispersion of the Jews. Specifically prophesied, specifically fulfilled. By the beginning of the 20th century Jews in every continent. Mm -hmm. Second, the relentless persecution of the Jews. Again, God said, wherever you go you are going to be persecuted. And they were wherever they went. Everywhere. The miraculous preservation of the Jews, to me one of the greatest miracles of history, is that these people could be dispersed all over the world and yet preserve their identity. No other people have been able yeah. to do that. And then finally, the desolation of the land. The land became totally desolate just as God said it was, and He had a purpose for that because it was a land nobody wanted. And he said, when the Jews come back it will become like the Garden of Eden. And which do you say is the most astounding of those four? The preservation of the Jews. Preservation it's just of unbelievable. Jews. Welcome back to my interview of Dr. Ray concerning his latest book, Israel and Bible Prophecy. He has just surveyed for us four prophecies that were fulfilled among the Jewish people before the 20th century began. And I want us to look now at the second section of the book where it discusses seven prophecies that were fulfilled in whole or in part during the 20th century. So, Dave, tell us about what is the seven prophecies. We went through the four curses, but yes. these all appear to be seven blessings to Israel. Yes, these are incredible prophecies. Okay. And you know, Nathan, the thing that's, that's so exciting about these is that we are living in a time where we can see them fulfilled. Yes. I mean, we're, we're living in the most exciting time since the first coming of Jesus. And now we're seeing prophecies given over 2,000 years ago that are being fulfilled in minute detail before our very eyes. I remember being a little kid and I was thinking, man, this is the most boring time. If I lived during the time of the Knights or the Revolutionary War, and then I went to college and I started, you know, getting a bigger picture yes, of the world, I'm like, yes. oh my word, we are living in probably one of the most exciting time That's periods right. in all of history. And, and the most important one of the seven okay. is the very first one, because it is the one that led to everything else. And that is the regathering of the Jewish people from the four corners of the earth. Yes. Now, this is prophesied over and over in the Hebrew Scriptures. And one of the interesting things about it is that quite often when I mention this to people today who don't know Bible prophecy or who are into replacement theology, they say, well, come on, this can't be some fulfillment of prophecy because the Jewish people are still unbelievers. I said, well, it says they're going to be regathered in unbelief. In unbelief yeah. And they said, well, why would God do that? Why? I said, it's called grace. <laughs> it's <laughs> grace. He is pursuing them just as He pursued you, He pursued me. And I ran from Him hard. He had to hit me over there with a two by four to get my attention. But the regathering of the Jewish people, and in fact there is a, there, there are, there's a verse, two verses in Jeremiah that are repeated. Uh, Jeremiah uh, 16, right? Yeah, and verse 23. 14 and 15. And, and it says that when the Jewish people look back on their history, 
they will know when it's all over and done, and they look back on their history, they will no longer swear by the God who delivered them from Egyptian captivity, but will swear by the God who regathered them from the four corners of the earth. That means it's the same God, but it means that they're going to consider the the regathering to be a greater miracle than the deliverance from Egyptian captivity, and you and I are living to see it with our own eyes. Well, I mean, how many people who haven't had a nation for over 1900 years have kept their cultural identity? They haven't, I mean, people come to the United States, we're a big melting pot, they lose their cultural identity, but not the Jewish people. 1900 years later they have a nation and they're still Jewish, they still follow the, the law. And, and you look in the Bible, everybody's against them. The Ammonites, the Hittites, uh, you know, it goes on and on. In Texas we say everybody but the Chigarbites yeah, were the against them. But yeah. the, the, and, and all the great empires, the uh-huh. Egyptian Empire, the Babylonian, the Syrians are all rampaging around Israel. And where are they today? In the dustbin of history. And where are the Jewish people? Back in the land. It's a miracle of God. And it has Satan terrified. Clearly and that set, up, that, that set up all the, the fulfillment of all these other prophecies. They yeah. came back, so the very first thing as a result of that is the reestablishment of the state of Israel, which is prophesied in the Scriptures that one day the state will be reestablished, and that occurred on May the 14th, 1948. And it was, it was a special birth, right? Where yeah. the labor oh, pains oh, happened? Yes. After the birth, not before. It will be a a special birth in the sense that the labor pains will come afterwards. And and, and it said, what woman has ever experienced that? And that's exactly what happened. They declared the independence. The next day Arab nations attack, and they've been attacking ever since then with the purpose of annihilating the state of Israel. So, yeah, you're right about that. And and the reestablishment of the state, you know, I, I just get goosebumps I, I, every time I go to Independence Hall in Tel Aviv. And I've been there many times. But it's just you are in a place where Bible prophecy was fulfilled. It's just, and, and, and it's amazing that 95% of all the groups that go to Israel never go to Independence Hall. That's a shame. Because the Hittites, they're not a nation again. The, the <laughs> no. Aztecs, the Mayans, no, but no, the, no. the nation of the Bible is That's back right. again. That's important. And then the third one I look at is the revival of the Hebrew language. Wow. Yes. Uh, I, I could go on all day about that. <laughs> Let me go ahead and mention the others. Okay. Well, another one is the reclamation of the land, which yes. had become totally desolate. And God said, when you come back, it'll become like the Garden of Eden. And it has. Oh, it's beautiful. And another one, the resurgence of the Israeli military. It says in the end times the Israeli military will be like uh, David against Goliath, and that's one of the tiniest nations in the world with one of the most effective militaries. And another one is the reoccupation of the city of Jerusalem, which occurred on June the 6th, 1967. And finally, the refocusing of world politics on Israel, and Israel is the focus of world politics. There are more international correspondence in Jerusalem than any other city in the world. Anything that happens there is headlines. Those are the seven prophecies that were fulfilled in whole or in part during the 20th century. Back to what you said about the reclamation of the land. Now, I don't think people understand how important this is because when the Romans destroyed Israel in 70 AD, they deforested the place, they destroyed it, they dispersed the Jews, and then they renamed it later on into Palestine. And literally for 2,000 years, you could count the trees for taxation oh, yeah, purposes, well, uh, right? Particularly after the Turks took over in, in the 1500s, yeah. the Turks ruled the land for 400 years, and they began to tax trees. <laughs> I hope our government never <laughs> hears about that, because the people started cutting down the trees to cut down their. Tax. By the time the Jews started coming back in, in 1900, uh, there were uh, no trees south of the Sea of Galilee. Wow. Uh, only 17,000 trees left in the whole country. And they know that as numbers and, and, yeah, of and, and, there, yeah. and the country was malaria-infested swamplands. The people who lived there. If you ask them, what are you? They would have all said, I'm a Syrian. That's how they consider. And there's hardly anybody living there. Yeah. They, they're absentee landlords, there's uh, renting out land to people who were about to starve to death. Nobody wanted this God forsaken land. But God said, I'm going to preserve it for you, and when you come back it will become like the Garden of Eden. They came back, they drained the malaria infested swamps, they began to plant trees. They planted over 200 million trees in the 20th century alone. And and that has tremendous ecological effects. The temperature, Uh, right, went down. uh, And and the the rainfall came came up, and uh, it was just unbelievable what happened when they began to come back and uh, rehabilitate uh, this land, just as God said. I love the drive when you go from Tel Aviv oh. up to Haifa. It is like driving through a botanical garden. <laughs> You're driving garden. through the Sharon Va- Sharon yeah. Valley. Oh, there's flowers. There's trees. Flowers, there's dates. There's banana I, plantations. I went up and picked uh, cotton. orange off a tree once. I mean, it's God brought the fruit back to land. And now, isn't it Israel the breadbasket of the Middle and East? And they claim the Jews came back and stole the land from they them. Did not. They sold that land to the Jews for exorbitant prices and laughed all the way to the bank that these crazy Jews wanted this land. <laughs> Thank you. 
Welcome back to our discussion of Dr. Reagan's new book, Israel and Bible Prophecy. Dave, we've been to the past. We're at the present, but what lies for the future of Israel? Well, the future of Israel, there is very bad news and some spectacular good news. Okay. The bad news comes first. The bad news is that there's some war involved in, uh, in the future of Israel, a lot of war. Possibly uh, the war of Psalm 83, I think, is most likely a war that was going to kind of be, happen pretty soon. Where Israel deals with its bordering neighbors? All the ones it has a common border with. Okay. And the reason I believe that is because the war that's, that is detailed is the war called the War of Gog and Magog over in Ezekiel 38. Uh -huh. and, uh -huh. uh, it involves nations that are on the outer periphery of Israel. It doesn't mention a single nation that it has a common border with. So, I think in Psalm 83 it's called, it's called War of Annihilation against Israel. And I think Israel will defeat all those nations. And then I think the Arabs of the Middle East will cry for Russia to come to their defense. And the Russians will come down with the outer perimeter in, in the War of Gog and Magog. And it says that with that huge force coming in, God will supernaturally destroy them on the hills of Israel in such a way that even the Jewish people will realize it came from God. That's the event that brings the Jewish people back I to God. Not necessarily Christ, but uh, to yeah, God, right? Yes, I think their hearts will begin to turn to God. God okay. And then, of course, the tribulation. We don't know for sure when the war of Gog and Magog will occur. Some put it in the tribulation. I think it's going to occur, start before the tribulation. But uh, nonetheless, uh, when the Antichrist signs a covenant with Israel, I think what's going to happen is that first of all, here's what I think was. The rapture is going to occur. The world's going to go into absolute chaos. The Antichrist is going to rise. He's going to have the answer to all the questions. He'll rise peacefully in Europe, take over Europe. He will, by that time, the Arab world will be decimated by the wars of uh, Psalm 38 and the, and the War of Gog and Magog. And so, uh, he will go, he will settle the situation in the Middle East by making a covenant with Israel. And when he makes that covenant, Tribulation begins. begins. And then Seven he years. will launch his campaign to conquer the rest of the world in the uh, wars of, of the seal judgments and the trumpet judgments. And uh, during that time, Israel will be protected by the Antichrist until the middle of the tribulation. They will look upon him as a savior. But when the middle of the tribulation, when he goes to Jerusalem and declares himself God, they will have nothing to do with him. They will turn against him, they will revolt against him because they. They know he is not God. He desecrates a temple, which yeah, means a third their temple, temple needs to be built. And then right? he becomes obsessed. I think okay. he's possessed by Satan. He becomes yeah. obsessed during the last three and a half years with totally annihilating the Jewish people from the face of the earth. Satan hates the Jewish people. He hates them because God used them to give the world the Bible, give the world the Messiah. They're the chosen people of God. God's determined to bring a great remnant to salvation. He didn't want a single Jew saved, so he's going to try to annihilate them, but he will not succeed. How many will die? Well, it says two thirds of them will two die thirds. during that time, according so, to Zechariah. So there's going to be a terrible carnage. But here's the good news. Good news. It says okay. that it will bring them to the end of themselves. At the end of the tribulation, they will look upon him whom they pierced. They will weep and well and mourn. They will receive Yeshua as their Messiah to the everlasting glory of God. He will regather all the Jewish people who are believers back to Israel. Jesus will reign as King of Kings and Lord of Lords from Mount Zion. The blessings of God will flow through Israel throughout all the world. You and I and others in our glorified bodies will be scattered around the world to reign over those in natural bodies. And it says that the Jews will be so highly honored during that time wow. that when a Jew walks by, ten Gentiles will grab his robe and say, May we walk with you because we know God is with you. Think of what a difference that is today. The day the Jew is the object of scorn, ridicule, jokes, persecution, murder. But during the millennial reign of Jesus he will be honored and God will fulfill all the promises during that time that He has made to the Jewish people. And their nation will be the prime nation of the world. That's amazing. So, Jesus Christ will have His capital in Jerusalem. That's right. He will be reigning from Mount Zion in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. David okay. in his glorified body will be reigning as the King of Jerusalem. And all the blessings of God, which are going to be many during that millennial time, are going to flow through the Jewish nation out to all the nations of the world. Now, why in the world should any Christian be concerned about all that? Uh, you know, why, why should a Gentile Christian be concerned the least about what is going on in Israel today? What God is doing among the Jewish people? They're not concerned. Well, that's the last part of my book. Okay. Well, when we come back, let's answer that. All right.
We've been discussing Dr. Reagan's new book about the Bible's end time prophecies regarding the Jewish people. And we've looked at four prophecies fulfilled before the 20th century began, seven prophecies fulfilled in whole or in part during the 20th century, and finally, the prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled. Dave, so let's get back to your question. Why in the world would Gentile Christians be interested in what's going on in Israel? I think the answer should be pretty obvious after all we've discussed, but <laughs> go ahead and tell us. Well, there are many reasons, okay. and uh, that's how I end the book, because I'm sure that the average Gentile Christian, particularly if they're caught up in replacement theology, is going to wonder, why in the world should I be concerned about the Jewish people? Yeah. Well, for one thing, it is proof positive that God exists. Uh, I, I think this, people say you can't prove that God exists. Well, I, I disagree with that. Uh, there are many proofs of God, of course, but one that is very, very important is the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. There is no other book in the world that contains prophecy that has been fulfilled. Yes. And, uh, there's none in the Book of Mormon, there's none in the Quran, uh, but uh, there's none in the Hindu Vedras. But there is here hundreds of prophecies that have already been fulfilled in history concerning individuals, cities, empires, but concerning the Jewish people, very specific prophecies. We're not talking about googly gop prophecies like you read in Nostr Nostradamus. Yeah. They're just nonsense sayings that you can take and say, oh, well, I think that applies to Hitler or whatever. No, these are specific. God says, I will disperse you all over the world if you're not faithful. I will preserve you. Your language will be revived in the end times and so forth. And these are specifically fulfilled. It's evidence that God exists. And secondly, it's evidence that the Bible is the Word of God. Amen. You see, Amen. today, uh, probably 80% or more seminaries teach that this book right here is not really God's revealed Word. It's man's search for God, and therefore it's full of myth and legend and superstition. Or it's something that can be relied on only as it applies to theology, but not to history or geography or, or anything like that. No, I believe that it is inerrant. It, it says it's the Word of God. It says it over and over. How could it not be inerrant if it's the Word of God? How can <laughs> God make a mistake? And Bible prophecy, fulfillment of, of detailed prophecies given thousands of years ago is proof positive not only that God exists, but that the Bible is the Word of God. Yes. Now, that's just two of, of several things why I think the Gentiles should be concerned about what God is doing among the Jewish people. Another one is that what God is doing among the Jewish people is proof positive that God is a faithful God. That when He makes a promise, He's going to keep it. Thousands of years ago, He said, in the end times, I will regather you in unbelief. He did. Mm -hmm. Your nation will be reestablished. Yes. You will be put back into your city of Jerusalem. That happened. Your language will be revived. I mean, a language, language. that had not been spoken for 2,000 years. People don't understand that. That when the Jews were dispersed, the Jews that went to Europe took Hebrew, mixed it with German, and came up with a language called Yiddish. The ones that went to, Spain, uh, to the Mediterranean Rim, they took Hebrew, mixed it with Spanish, and came up with a language called Ladino. For 2,000 years Hebrew was spoken only in the synagogue when the, when the uh, rabbi would read it, and often he didn't even understand it. He read it <laughs> phonetically, and it was like going to a Catholic Mass that was conducted in Latin, and nobody yeah, knew like what was going on. we all speaking yeah. Latin today. And, and yet God revived that language through a man by the name of Eliezer ben Yehuda, one of the greatest miracles of history. And, and there's a street named after Eliezer ben Yehuda in almost every city in Israel today. God is faithful. When He makes a promise, He fulfills it. We're seeing promise after promise after promise fulfilled. And you know why that should get a Gentile Christian excited? Because God has made a lot of promises to the church. Yes. And it means just as He has been faithful in fulfilling these, He's going to fulfill every promise He's made in the church. He has promised that one day soon Jesus is going to appear in the heavens. There's going to be a shout of an archangel, the blowing of a trumpet, the dead in Christ are going to be resurrected, uh, the living in Christ are not even going to experience death. They're going to go up and be translated on the way up. We're going to go back to heaven with the Lord. We're going to be judged of our works, not to determine our salvation, but our degrees of reward. We're going to receive those rewards. We're going to sit down at a feast with Jesus and celebrate our union with Him. And at the end, He's going to say, let's go. And Amen. we're going to get up and return with Him. Exciting. We're going to come back. We're going to see Him when He comes back to the Mount of Olives. We're going to be there to shout, hallelujah, uh, Hosanna to the Son of David. We're going to see Him crowned as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We're going to see Him reigning over over all the world. We are going to experience that reign, a reign of 1,000 years of perfect peace, righteousness, and justice. These are the promises to us, and that we will live with God the Father and God the Son forever on a new earth. It's, 
I can see Him fulfilling these promises of the Jews. I know He's going to fulfill every promise He's made to you and me. And finally, another thing I would mention, it's okay. a demonstration of the meaning of grace. Grace. All throughout the book. The Jewish people are the most rebellious people on planet <laughs> Earth. Their own prophets say they're stiff-necked, they're, uh-huh. they're strong-willed, they're hard-headed. That's their own prophets saying this. And, and yet God has never given up on them. He pursues them and pursues them and pursues them and pursues them because He's determined to bring a great remnant to salvation. That's grace. They are a witness of the grace of God. And finally, I think that what God is doing among the Jewish people is overwhelming evidence that you and I are living in the season of the Lord's return. Because all of these prophecies are being fulfilled before our very eyes. They're all coming together, convergence as never before. And it's tr- it, it, there's just no doubt that we are living in the final days, that Jesus is at the very door of yes. Heaven waiting for the Lord's command to step out on that cloud and come for His church. You open. The very first paragraph, God's love for the Jewish people is clearly demonstrated in the chronicle of His faithfulness of fulfilling the promises contained in the prophecies that He has given them through the prophets. It's a story of amazing grace, and that's why it's so important to the church. You start with grace, you end the book with grace. Is it a book then about the grace to Gentiles? Are you trying to convince Gentiles that Israel is important? Are you trying to convince Jews that Israel is important? Yeah. Or are you trying to convince us that God's grace extends to everybody, not just us? That's true. And, and, and just replacement theology is so awful in that it says God washed His hands of the Jewish people, has no purpose for them, and He could not, what's happening in Israel today could not be of God because these people are stubborn and unbelieving, and that is just as wrong as it can be. God never gives up on anybody. He pursues and pursues and pursues because He does not wish that any should be lost, but all should come to repentance. And that's the only reason He's delayed the return of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, what a great, great, (laughs) let's end on that. (laughs) Folks, our time is up. I hope this discussion with Dr. Reagan has been a blessing to you, and I hope you will be back with us again next week. Until then, this is Nathan Jones speaking for Lamb and Lion Ministries, saying, look up, be watchful, for our redemption is drawing near. The Bible is literally filled with prophecies about the Jewish people, past, present, and future. And in fact, the Jewish people are the focus of end-time Bible prophecy. Folks, I've spent the past 40 years studying these remarkable prophecies and their fulfillments, and I have put together a summary of them in a new book of mine that is titled, Israel in Bible Prophecy, Past, Present, and Future. The incredible story of Israel in Bible prophecy is proof positive of the existence of God and that the Bible is the Word of God. The first section of the book takes a look at four prophecies that were fulfilled before the beginning of the 20th century. The second section features seven prophecies that were fulfilled in whole or in part during the 20th century. The final section of the book takes a look at the prophecies concerning the future of Israel, showing how the suffering of the Jewish people in the Great Tribulation will lead to their national repentance and salvation. Finally, there is an epilogue in which I explain how all this is relevant to Christians in the 21st century. The book runs 256 pages in length, and it can be yours for a donation of $20 or more, including the cost of shipping. To order a copy, either call our office at the number you see on the screen, or place your order through our website at lambline.com. Thank you for joining us on today's Christ in Prophecy, a presentation of Lamb and Lion Ministries, a non-denominational ministry dedicated to teaching the fundamentals of biblical prophecy and proclaiming the soon return of Jesus. 